a lot of the focus is on generative AI. You know, and having um, been in households that have kids that are verbal and kids that are math oriented, I see that dichotomy as, you know, the verbal versus the math. And I think we live for, for a long time in the world of math and we're starting to come into the world of verbal. Um, you know, which when you look at the generative AI use cases, they're very much a function of uh, how can you take something that's a logical concept and extend it out so that it's a stream of words. Welcome to Software Snack Bites. I'm your host, Shomit Ghosh of Bold Start Ventures. And today we're excited to have Sid Bala on the pod. Sid is CIO of Data Analytics uh, and head of public cloud at BNY Mellon and was previously head of uh, product strategy and innovation at TIAA. In this episode, we're going to cover the enterprise technology behind the massive uh, market that is asset management. And so I guess just to start off, Sid, like let's let's start off with your background. How'd you come to be at BNY Mellon and kind of doing public cloud and all the and, and all the data and analytics stuff you're doing today? Like everything, it starts with a good story. And in this case, it started with a cup of coffee. Uh, I've been fortunate in my career to, you know, navigate many large companies and I love working at Fortune 500 companies with the breadth of um, opportunities and challenges that you encounter. And um uh, I also have this belief in the old saying that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And it's kind of been like that. So that was how my coffee progressed. And, uh, you know, I was invited to come and work at the bank. And I showed up at a point where, you know, we were in the middle of a very significant transformation with modernization of infrastructure. Um, as you probably know, I grew up in engineering. So, you know, straddling the world of engineering and infrastructure was a new challenge for me. Um, and I love doing things at enterprise scale. And I feel like at the bank, uh, there's a lot of the um, core components that allow you to do real meaningful transformation at enterprise scale. And I thought that was a great opportunity. And, uh, you know, when I first came to the bank, we were in the very early days with cloud and haven't seen how the industry had progressed over the previous decade with cloud in the all the way from the early days of Amazon uh, to how enterprises were using cloud meaningfully. I sensed that there was a real opportunity to start doing the same with cloud at the bank. And, uh, you know, I think when you take those two components, the ability to uh, engineer enterprise transformation, as well as the opportunity that cloud presented for us to go to um, market in new and interesting ways, I think was an irresistible combination. Before we actually dive into the BNY Mellon stuff, I want to actually, you know, when, when we first met, you were at TIAA and, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, I think one of the, one of the fascinating things was you were really focused on embracing the public cloud and you were doing you were, I mean, you were diving deep into the weeds. You understood what was happening, you know, actually at the infrastructure level. And so I guess the question I have for you is, is, you know, I think a lot of people hear, oh, all these enterprises are moving to the cloud and stuff like that. But what were actually some of the major results that came from TIA moving to the cloud? Like what actually was the impact from being able to do that? You know, one thing I like to say is every organization has its own unique DNA. And when you talk to different enterprises that are on their cloud journey, you're going to find out that that cloud journey is very much a function of how that organization is structured. You know, so organizational structure, culture, uh, the ability to execute, uh, whether technology teams are federated or centralized. You know, there's a number of different factors that play into it. You know, I was recently driving across the country and I was curious. So I went to Wikipedia and I looked up something because I was curious as to how early pioneers had gone west. And it turns out that there's only five gaps in the Appalachian Mountains that you can go through. Okay, interesting. And you know, so it was a it was a sequence of trial and error, and you had to find the right gaps. And even once you got through, it wasn't really certain that you'd get to your destination. There was a lot of challenges along the way. Uh, and I feel like you know, in some ways, not to stretch the analogy, but cloud journeys are kind of like that. It's uh, and uh, it's also a function of where you are in time. So when I think back to the first reinvent. Uh, that I went to in 2014, I could look across the room and see everybody who was doing cloud at the time. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you can do that anymore. Unfortunately not. I used to love reInvent. Unfortunately, it's got a little bit, a little bit too big right now. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the same thing with KubeCon in 2017, you know, I was wandering around from room to room and talking to people who are actually writing code and building things. Uh, and now you look at the cloud native uh, compute foundation map and it's, it's huge. So it's amazing how these ecosystems evolve, you know, and uh, I love seeing these te technology transformations. So 
to answer your question, it's very much a function of time. And where we were in time when I was uh, at TIA was very much the notion that cloud was un untested, unknown. Uh, it was very much about the art of the possible, which is why a, a whole bunch of what we were doing in that context was uh, under the umbrella of innovation, because innovation was everything that was new and, and emerging at the time. And that included things like uh, like blockchain and machine learning and uh, algorithms and cloud. Cloud was part of that. So in order to demonstrate the art of the possible, it was very much about how do we quickly incept, incubate, and roll out ideas. And the challenge I put to my team was, can you go from idea to execution in five minutes? What we found really exciting about the cloud at that time was the fact that you could engineer infrastructure as code, which meant you had a lot more control about how you would design, develop, and, and implement the solutions, right? We were just a game changer. I think some of us who came from the DevOps uh, world were kind of used to that working for code, but having it work for infrastructure was something new. And I, I love that idea of, you know, uh, in, my, in my mind, I imagine an engineer sitting in the desk saying, hey, you know what, I want to do something and their ability to then engineer and get access to that infrastructure. And this is a far cry from even the start of the century where if you wanted to do something, you had to buy physical infrastructure. You had to go, you know, plunk down a bunch of dollars for something. And it was way more expensive than this new model that we had um, accessible to us, right? Especially if you wanted to quickly uh, take an idea from concept to execution. So I think at, at TIA, it was very much that the flavor of innovation, the flavor of the art of the possible, uh, how do you get fast and and test out what, you know, in those days were new capabilities that were being offered primarily by Amazon uh, with Amazon Web Services. So, you know, a lot of the capabilities that we built was working with engineering teams saying, what do you want to build and how can we help you build that, building a lot of the automation. I think there was definitely some lessons learned there in terms of how can you take um, capabilities and componentize them. So, you know, you want to spin up a database you want to spin up a, a, a compute cluster. How do you do that and do it very quickly? Um, in those days, I, I also got a lot of inspiration from Heroku and how you know Heroku had that essentially had taken all of the infrastructure, abstracted it away, and given you some kind of interface. That you could, yeah, and I loved that, and I, I wanted to bring that concept to the enterprise. So that was kind of the primary thrust of that um, that part of the journey. Um, definitely a contrast with you know my my philosophy now here at the bank with cloud is. Um, is very much, uh, you know, our mantra here is fit for use and fit for purpose. I also tend to be very commercially driven. So we're always making sure that all of the work that we do is funded and governed. And that means we need to have a, a, an appropriate governance process lined up with our risk and controls posture, uh, as well as the business case to go with it. Um, one of the critical things that I've learned along the way uh, for enterprises is the importance of having a FinOps function to really understand what, what the cloud economic model looks like. And then line that up with the business case and make sure that it makes sense. Um, so I, th I think yeah, there's a I, there's a huge difference between how I approach cloud, you know, six or seven years ago versus how I approach cloud now. Uh, very much a function of the learning that's happened as well as the maturity of uh, the technology, um, as well as you know, we're not, we we now live in a multi-cloud world, and so um, that's also an interesting element of this is which capabilities are available through which partners. One thing I'm always curious about in scenarios like this is when you have these large scale migrations, hey, we're moving to the cloud, we're moving to this data warehouse or data lake, whatever you know you want to call it. Um, it is a large project. It requires a ton of investment, a ton of changes to the workflow of, of all the developers. Um, and so how like the ROI is clearly there some point in the future, but how do you justify that ROI to the business execs who are looking at the business right now and saying, hey, we need to drive revenue growth and, and margin and all of that. So I don't know if you have any tips around there, but what has worked for you uh, when you kind of justify these these uh, migrations? Well, the first thing I'll say is it's not easy. There, are, there have been some firms that have done that well in the sense that they said, well, we'll go all in on cloud. We'll take all of these workloads. We'll migrate them. Um, you know, we have a plan for doing that and, and we'll shut down our data centers. I think the, the number of firms that have done that is very small. The road to large scale cloud migrations is fraught with difficulty for a number of reasons. I mean, just the, the variety of tech stacks you'll find inside a typical enterprise is significant. So for you to be able to map that onto what you're going to do in the cloud, uh, what you'll typically find is it distills down to two elements of the process, you know, and, and I think in some cases, uh, the default pattern that, that enterprises go into is they look across all of their uh, footprint. 
they do some kind of disposition um, of what they're going to do with these different workloads and how they're going to migrate them. And then they have a plan and it, it distills down into two phases. One is there's a certain amount of modernization you have to do to your stack to make it cloud ready. Uh, and then there's the actual migration bit, right? Um, what's worked really well for us here at the bank is we took that whole journey and split it into two pieces and we did the modernization bit first. Hmm. So, you know, we've done the modernization on-prem in the sense that we've gotten to a significant uh, critical mass of cloud-ready workloads, which then gives us the optionality to choose, pick and choose when we want to go to the cloud, why and how, and make sure that those are aligned with our business objectives. Right? I think that's worked out really well for us. Um, it's allowed us, for example, to um, to launch cloud native businesses like uh, Pershing X's Wolf platform, um, which is born in the cloud. Uh, the same with Data Vault on the data analytics side, again, born in the cloud. Uh, and so we have the ability to pick and choose the cloud capabilities we need along with the modernized workloads that we want to migrate and, and do that in a very intentional and thoughtful way. Whether that's going to translate uh, evenly across any enterprise. Again, like I think it's, it goes back to a lot of the factors I mentioned earlier. It, it's hard to execute on a large enterprise transformation if your pieces don't align. So for example, I know just coming from my background, uh, having seen cloud journeys at a number of different firms, how they started off, you know, 10 years ago was many, you'd, you'd have forays into the cloud by different groups, right? And it's been hard, I think, it would be hard to kind of then start to rationalize all of that. So if you've got, for example, one team that's gone and built something in Google Cloud for very good reasons, and another team that's gone and built something in Azure, and you're looking to build enterprise capabilities and pull that all back and do it consistently, it's hard. And then, you know, there's a lot of vested equity in in terms of the effort that went into some of these cloud things that uh, it's important to recognize and reward and um, and build on the foundation that many of these teams might have created. So again, coming back to what is your enterprise viewpoint of cloud look like? Uh, I think that's a critical decision for any business. Uh, and then being able to then take it from idea to execution is another, it's almost like a zero to one journey that um, can be hard. If we double click on that modernization component that you were talking about though, does that mean that you are starting at a, specific team or a specific business unit and saying, hey, let's modernize this specific this workload. And then over time, okay, as we get more workloads and we can we can over we can, you know, migrate everyone over, but this is a team's or business unit specific decision. Again, it, it's enterprise wide in our case, right? So across all of our lines of business, all of our technology teams, uh, the the choices that we've made in terms of rationalizing our tech stack or architectures. Um, I think enterprise architecture is a very important component of this. Um, again, it's hard to be truly consistent in a large enterprise with enterprise architecture. Being very intentional about software choices, rationalizing your capabilities, which tools you use for what, um, you know, can be hard when you've got a huge amount of diversity in your tech footprint. So um, I think in our case, that was also an important component of being able to look at our enterprise architecture and say, how do we want this to look consistently across across the bank, um, which was a helpful component of that. Your LinkedIn title is Storyteller, and I, I love that because I know how much you like stories. But uh, but I, let's frame that in the context of of your role, right? Uh, as CIO, as 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 head of uh, the the public cloud, right? Like, what is that storytelling component mean? Are you is this how you like communicate? Hey, here's why we're doing these changes because it's going to bring about this vision. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so LinkedIn is an interesting thing. I, I keep hearing recently, by the way, that that LinkedIn is very cringe worthy, right? Like there's a cringe element of LinkedIn. In in many of my mentoring conversations, I explore this concept that uh, the way we show up to the world, especially on LinkedIn, and the way that we show up for ourselves uh, is not exactly congruent. There's, they're not exactly the same. And wherever there's that gap, I think there's a tension because you feel a little bit of pressure to show up as a certain person in a work context. And meanwhile, you know, you feel that, hey, you know what, I, I'm not that person. And I, I saw this article about LinkedIn that, you know, if you looked at your LinkedIn profile, you'd feel, uh, you'd feel different about yourself, uh, which I think many people feel. In my case, I think, so this, the storytelling aspect uh, came about I, when I first started my career at CERN and I found myself bridging the worlds of physics and technology. 
Uh, and in order to build bridge those worlds, you had to be able to talk both languages. So almost it's it's an interpreter, you know, storytelling concept is how do you take a tech concept and talk to physicists about it? How do you take a physics concept and talk to technologists about it? And then I started to see that uh, trend perpetuate in other roles I had, whether it was in pharma or insurance or finance. It was always these two languages uh, that you had to you know, cross pollinate. I'm, I'm personally not a huge fan of titles for the simple reason that I don't think a title tells you much about a person. Uh, and I'd like to also role model this for a lot of people in the industry that says, you know, show up as who you are. I personally believe every single person has a superpower and that superpower is their creative instinct, the creative urge. What are you creating? What are you building? What are you innovating on? And be that person, right? And show up in the world like that person uh, I don't think a corporation is going to give you your identity. Uh, and it, it might be that, like the, some of these titles and, and identities that you glom onto with a, either through virtue of working at a company or working in a particular city or uh, through a certain title is, is a label and, and you can outgrow labels. And, um, you know, so I really feel that it's important to craft your own identity, explore your own values and show up as the person that you want to be. And, uh, you know, I've always had my title on LinkedIn as storyteller because that was a core part of my identity. And uh, it also helps me transcend roles and uh, gives me a lot of freedom to be who I want to be. That, that makes sense. And uh, I love that about you. And, and uh, I like that it doesn't change no matter what. So but um, let's let's move into some stuff around BNY Mellon specifically. And, and I guess like first, um, maybe just to set the context, like what do the data and analytics products do for BNY Mellon customers? So data and analytics is our newest business at the bank. Um, it's, it's its own business. And the mission of data and analytics is for us to be a preeminent uh, provider of software and data services in the financial services world. We have a number of products that we've built out and we'll you know, continue to explore what the market offers. But a lot of it is tied back to who we want to be as a firm, uh, one of which is to, um, is to show up better for our clients. And... In terms of data and analytics, we have uh, products that manage data on behalf of our customers, as well as a um, platform called Eagle, which has capabilities like accounting and performance built in on top of the core data management capabilities that we have. And our mission with data and analytics is to, uh, in, in some ways, be more for our customers with the customers that we have, but then also explore uh, where else we can bring those core capabilities in uh, data and analytics to our customers in a better way. So when I hear data and analytics, you know, my mind immediately goes to, oh my God, you have to take all the sources of this data, you have to pull it in, you have to clean it, you have to normalize it, you got to pipe it out somewhere, right? Like all these sort of uh, challenges. And I guess my question for you is, with all the noise around the modern data stack and the tooling and, and everything that's there, like, are we at a place where you and the team are like, wow, this is fairly easy and repeatable and, you know, and we can, we can get going no problem. Or is there still a lot of kind of manual work and toil needed to, to kind of make all those components work together? Well, I think the, the technology's obviously evolved and gotten better. And I think when, if, when we go out as engineers and look at the tech stack that's available to us, it's quite powerful. Uh, and it's getting better, right? Um, I think we're starting to see new ways in which enterprises exchange data. We're seeing um, platforms in the cloud that allow us to uh, integrate across platforms and also be closer to our customers where they are. You know, so building a uh, data and analytics platform today, if we start from scratch, is a very different prospect from uh, what we did in decades ago. But we also have to respect the heritage of what we've built. You know, so a lot of what we've built around uh, those capabilities, uh, part of it, it rests on the heritage of the technology that we've used to deliver those capabilities to our clients. And part of it is us continuously exploring and evolving uh, our tech stack to use the best of breed of what's available to us. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, what's, a, what's a challenging thing about building products in this space that maybe most people wouldn't think about? Uh, and it could be the way that you distribute it, it could be the way that it's it's made, it could be, yeah, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but so what's the most challenging thing about kind of building products in this area? Well, I think, um, and by the way, I think this is an area where enterprises can learn a lot from how startups build products. You know, we, uh, we definitely 
have some of that in our DNA, and we're also building uh, more of it into how we approach it. So whether it's uh, product development, whether it's go-to-market, whether it's you know product market fit, um, I think there's a lot that we can learn in that respect, and we're, we're looking to build those things in. So I think how much is our enterprise uh, heft a benefit, and how much of it you know can we look to uh, see as an opportunity to improve? I think th- that dynamic between the existing and the new uh, is really where a lot of, I wouldn't say challenges necessarily, but really opportunities. I look at those as opportunities where, you know, um, taking a look at what we have and where we want to be and driving that roadmap forward into what are the technical capabilities we can build? What are the business needs that we can fulfill? What are the new markets we can enter? Uh, what are the products and services that we can incorporate? I think each one of those uh, dimensions has an element of a roadmap in there that we would pursue. If you were to look at it as a challenge, it would be intimidating. But if you look at it as an opportunity, it's, it's really exciting. So that between that that new and existing, I think there's a very, like you said, there's there's that opportunity. With opportunity, there's also the fact that you could you know go chase down a rabbit hole and and find nothing there. But maybe the learning in that chase was useful for something else. So I guess my question to you is, given all the surface area of the different things that you could experiment with on the new side, how do you know when it's worth it to go or how do you how do you help make the decision of when to go explore the new versus stick with what's working already so i think some of this is my personal viewpoint on this having you know just been in technology for decades and seen so many uh, trends come and go um, i can tell you for example when i used to look at open source products back in the day i would go look at the code bases and see how active they were i would look at adoption rates i would look at number of downloads and try and get a sense of what the penetration of that particular product was in the market as, as a proxy for, you know, how much risk am I taking on by adopting this, right? Uh, with anything early enough in its life cycle, there's a risk to adoption and you've got to evaluate whether there's a trade-off for that risk. I think well, well-established products, well-established vendors, uh, well, well-established platforms take away some of that risk. Uh, but we're always looking at um, technology choices holistically. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did quite a bit of work around rationalizing capabilities, and we'll 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 link up to that. So if we're looking at, let's say we're looking at something like um, a business intelligence, or let's say we're looking at streaming, you know, as a capability, there's obviously going to be some kind of platform or product that we use today, and and usually it's a it's a few choices that we make. One is, do we add something new into the mix? That means we increase our complexity, or do we replace? So we reduce our complexity, but there's a risk of, you know, taking something out and putting something new in. But every every decision that we make is very much uh, governed by what's the risk reward trade off on that. I, I think it really helps to have some kind of industry view on it. So, you know, who's uh, where are you getting information from? What are your information funnels? Uh, are you talking to enough peers in the industry? Are you talking to technology providers? Are you are you looking at how architectures are developing and emerging? Uh, a lot of this sometimes, you know, um, it, it's a function of the ecosystem. So how much are you looking at the complementarity of uh, things that fit together? So, you know, we talked about Kubernetes earlier, like which Kubernetes platforms run on which cloud providers, which support which kind of ecosystems, which support which kind of architectures. And, you know, I think there's always um, an understanding that's required of how the overall architecture plays out. And then a big thing for me personally, as well as is, is the operational tail, right? What is it going to cost to, uh, run and operate and maintain these platforms over time, and that's something that's that's sometimes overlooked when when um, platforms and products get adopted. Uh, but it's a very critical and important uh, facet of being able to manage this end to end over a long period of time. Before we we get into uh, a certain topic du jour that that uh, of course we will have to discuss, um, I want to ask you just one question that you know I think a lot of listeners really like to hear about the actual applied use cases of, of some of these things, right? The the Kubernetes, the the real-time streaming infrastructures, like all these sort of things, right? The founders are building it, but you know, what's kind of the the end use case of those? And so um, out of the whole, you know, data and analytics product group, is there any sort of uh, use case that you would like to uh, highlight as like, hey, this is what, you know, some of these technological underpinnings have have enabled for for customers. Without getting into too much detail, I think what I'm really excited about is um, is how data gets transferred and shared across 
enterprises. You know, I'm, I, I'm really excited about the opportunities that we're seeing now with new platforms with, with data sharing uh, and data distribution. So obviously being in the data analytics business, that's an important component of the whole data pipeline. Um, so if you look across history, you've got a bunch of different data transfer patterns, whether that's file transfers or APIs. Um, but I think one of the one of the critical components that I've seen that I'm excited about in, in uh, modern terms is the ability to have entitlements on that data. So who can do what with the, you know with which piece of data and where and how, uh, and the the ability to govern that using policy I think is very interesting. Um, and as you can imagine, when we're in the business of uh, data curation and data distribution, that's a very important aspect of us being able to manage data and do it consistently across uh, across uh, enterprises in a B two B scenario. So, I think that's one particular use case that I think is uh, is a function of of very much the technology uh, and capabilities that we have available today. I've held off for long enough. We're going to talk about AI, and uh, and and you know, obviously, your team is frankly, looking at so much data and, and again, aggregating that data and, and being able to uh, extract analyses from that. So I think, I mean, I guess I'll start off just very broad. Like, how are you thinking about AI's impact on on the products that, that you're managing? Well, first of all, it's hard when you're looking at the volume of information that you're being fed and also the speed at which things are changing mm-hmm. um, to say, well, you know, what do I what do I latch on to and what do I explore? Uh, but at the same time, I think there's lots of things that we can start to take a look at. You know, we've we've previously talked about, for example, machine learning, um, there's publicly available information about what we've done with machine learning, for example, for predicting settlement uh, trade fails and so on. Yeah. And in terms of where we are right now, I think a lot of the focus is on generative AI. Um, you know, and having, um, having been in households that have kids that are verbal and kids that are math oriented. I see that dichotomy as, you know, the verbal versus the math. And I think we live for for a long time in the world of math and we're starting to come into the world of verbal, Um, you know, which when you look at the generative AI use cases, they're very much a function of uh, how can you take something that's a logical concept and extend it out so that it's a stream of words, essentially. Uh, And what are the use cases that lend themselves to that? And I think you know, the world is in an exploratory phase right now. We're starting to see those things. Uh, what I've seen over time is uh, that's interesting to me is not so much the innovation that comes out of enterprises, but the innovation that gets folded into products that then drives customer behavior, that then drives the demand. So, for example, people got used to recommendation engines and things like Amazon Shopping Experience or Netflix, and then that became a thing, right? People said, well, this is... This is something that I expect to see in a product and a recommendation engine became a thing. Same with predictive analytics. As you start to see it show up in products, it becomes part of the customer experience, then it becomes an expectation. Uh, I think we'll start to see that more and more with uh, generative AI as well. Is to what extent are those experiences being built into existing products that then become an expectation? One of the things that we recently announced was a partnership with Microsoft. And you know, I definitely expect um, AI to be a component of that relationship. It's a it's a pretty significant relationship on technology and go to market uh, between the bank and data analytics in particular and Microsoft. And um, you know, one of the things to me, again coming from an engineering background, what's interesting to me is the fact that you can write a copilot now that will explore a database that you've got, and then be able to interact with that in a natural language way, right? Uh, I'm really interested to see how that changes the landscape of dashboard products. So, for example, historically, if you wanted to explore the data in a database, you'd present a dashboard to a customer, they'd slice and dice and, you know, filter and things like that. But it was a sequence of steps. You'd say, well, here's all your data. Here's how you filter it. Here's how you sort it. Well, this is the chunk I really am interested in. Uh, Whereas with a natural language interface, you can actually ask for what you want. And then if you want to render that into a chart, you can do that. Um, so I'm curious to see how that plays out. I think, you know, I, I like to see what is the what is the easiest path to adoption. And that seems to be a, an interesting use case that uh, you could play out in many, many different contexts, many, many different ways. But as long as you've got a way for uh, data in a database to, to be exposed to something that can query uh, and present it in a, a human interactive way, I think there's some value there. 
But I think, you know, I'm just scratching the surface here. I'm sure when you look across many enterprises, there's hundreds and hundreds of use cases that present themselves uh, that are uh, potentially opportunities to work more effectively. Um, I, I think in our case, one of the elements of our culture is to empower our workforce. And um, that's definitely an opportunity for us to look at how we can internally um, use the resources we have to to empower people to work more effectively. So it, what's interesting is BNY, for example, has been doing, uh, like like you said, ML for a very long time. You talked about that settlement trade example. And that's something that has been at the forefront and continuing to be used. Now, like you said, uh, I, I like the way you describe it. It was a verb, instead of math, it's, it's becoming verbal. And what that allows is for, you know, perhaps not as technical people to still explore what they could do and, and come up with, with new use cases. And so I think that's really exciting potential. At the same time, you know, machine learning is still really good at, at prediction engines and, and things like that, that is still very useful. So how, how do you kind of think about like, is Gen AI and, and the, the excitement around that almost taking away from some of the focus on, you know, some of the, the ways that you could apply ML in certain areas or, or what, what's the, you know, kind of, how do you think about the balance there across enterprises, not BNY specific, but just across enterprises? Yeah, across enterprises, I think, and, and we've seen this uh, movie before, right? With uh, with cloud, we saw it, we saw it with blockchain, uh, where there's a tremendous amount of frothiness and hype around a particular technology. And then uh, it, it generates a lot of FOMO around, you know, what am I doing? You know, what's my partner doing? What's my competitor doing? And uh, what should I be doing? And so on. And I think it's important to realize that we've been through this before. Um, and what are the lessons learned that we can take into this new journey with AI? But I think across when you when you look across enterprises, for sure, um, it's hard to have the discipline to say, you know, I'm going to continue to invest in the things that have worked well for me because uh, generative AI is so accessible and it's so widely used, and there's new use cases being you know developed every day, new capabilities being developed every day. It's getting more powerful. Um, that is hard to ignore, right? So I think it's uh, the way I like to look at this, just like we've looked at many technology trends over the years is take a portfolio view of it. So if you have an investment portfolio and you choose what your asset allocation is, it's the same approach with technology is decide where you want to allocate your resources, your time, your dollars. Uh, and you know what percentage of that should that be as a part of your overall portfolio? Um, I think it'll be imperative for enterprises to discover the real value um, of generative AI as it applies to use cases, because it, if you don't, then it runs the risk of being a novelty. Right? And then once the novelty factor wears off, you're like, well, what am I doing with this? And is it, you know? And, and I think, by the way, that's another that's another very important part of the culture at the bank is uh, a commercial mindset. Is how how are we looking at things in a way that makes sense commercially? In the case of cloud, as I mentioned earlier, is very much you know, is every use case funded and governed? Does the business case make sense? Uh, I expect we're going to take that same philosophy to a number of other uh, initiatives to make sure that you know we're doing this in a thoughtful way uh, where it makes sense and has commercial outcomes. What are the biggest challenge challenges that you see to Gen AI adoption within enterprises? You know, there's security, there's data components, there's there's form factor, there's uh, like you said, there's new things happening every day. There's agents, there's different types of agents, like all this sort of stuff, right? Out of all that realm of stuff, like what's the biggest challenge for enterprises adopting things here? Well, I think a lot of enterprises from what I hear are adopting generative AI. Well, true, They're yeah. doing it in different ways. Again, I wouldn't see this necessarily as a challenge, but really the, the important milestone to achieve in that journey is make sure that you're delivering some kind of value and outcomes to it. Um, you know, innovation for innovation's sake only goes so far. It's really important to tie that to, you know, how is this making a difference to me? The thing that I love to do in this case is make sure that it's tied to some kind of client outcomes. Because if your clients are seeing the value, you know, it's a lot more justifiable. And so as we start to look at this world, which, you know, in my view is very, very much nascent and emerging and developing, um, it's important to kind of think of looking down the road, where does it deliver the value and what, what shape does that value take? You are someone who, again, understands the DevOps side very well, as well as the architecture side. And so I'm going to ask you a DevOps question, which is going to be, I guess, AI has a lot of surface area within DevOps because it's touching code in so many different ways. And I guess, what areas do you think will have the most productive impacts? Is it co-pilots so that we're all 
you know, shipping code really quickly? Is it, you know, auto generated testing? Is it using an incident analysis? Is it, you know, is it all of the above? Like kind of where do you think the, the most productive areas that we'll see come from this generative AI wave? As an engineer, I used to always joke that much, much of the code you say in modern code bases came from Stack Overflow. Yeah. You know, and that, that was part of the engineer's workflow is, hey, I want to do this thing. Well, how do I do it? Let me, let me look it up. And invariably, you know, Stack Overflow would be the first result you go look at and like, let me try this out. You know, and in many cases, that's part of the way the wisdom of crowds came in, right? It, it was usually something that, um, that was vetted, had worked for somebody before, and then you'll try it and it may or may not work, but you, then you'll tweak it. And well, at least you've got part of the way towards your solution. It's hard to imagine that there's too much, especially in enterprise software that's unique uh, or hasn't been, been built before because the core computing constructs are um, are the same, right? They don't vary. But what really varies is bus the business logic of whatever apps you're building. And you know, in some cases, some of that can be encoded in rules, and that's pretty much all you're left with is, is the rules. Uh, everything else is is something that you can probably get a solution for. So now imagine you have an a AI copilot that shows up and can do all of that for you. Well, that's made your workflow a lot more efficient. So having used uh, copilot in GitHub myself, you know, I find it hugely valuable uh, simply because it it gets you, uh, it, it takes out that significant part of your workflow that involves you stepping away from your IDE, going off somewhere else and doing something. So I, I like I like being in the IDE. Uh, obviously, there's risks to that, right? You have to be wary of where the code comes from, how it learned, what the source of that uh, data was. Just like anything you would, uh, you know, there's a certain level of skepticism. I think that um, the more you start to use generative AI capabilities, you, it starts becoming part of your DNA as well. But, you know, I, I find that interesting simply because it, it shortens that time for you to get to a solution. Uh, but then, you know, as we start to look across the DevOps cycle, anywhere that we can um, shorten that cycle time between uh, build and and deploy, uh, I think is valuable. And there's definitely some opportunities there for um, AI helpers to show up and, and do things. I haven't yet seen anything in the in the code review cycle, but that might be an interesting aspect where you can. Uh, typically, what you've seen is when engineering teams do code reviews, they they stop work. And you know they wait for the code review to happen, and it's a it's an asynchronous process. But having something that can um, reliably do code reviews for you might be useful as well. Well, uh, stay tuned. We may may have something for you uh, from the from the bold start side. But um, it, it the uh, the the one thing I want to ask you around that is you know you mentioned hey from an engineer perspective I'm staying in the IDE. This is great. It's helping me generate code. All this sort of stuff. But now take the architecture lens, right? As an architect, aren't you losing some of the context that you get from actually writing the code yourself, like from from just understanding all the different components and everything like that? Now you're having something just generated for you, like you're losing that context, right? Like, how do you think about that? I think it's a maturity of of the technology. If you if you've seen any of the movies that show the early days of Apple and you see them tinkering in the in the garage with uh, with their circuits, yeah, we don't do that anymore. I think the hobbyist side of things has has given way to other capabilities. We've moved up the stack, right? Um, I think it'll be the same. Yeah. Architects like to work in terms of black boxes. So if you can make it a reliable black box, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> I like that. Well, so I want to close on on this before we wrap things up, which is, uh, you know, a lot of founders listen to this. Uh, they're going to be like, oh, Sid sounds like a very forward thinking technologist, someone who understands all this stuff, you know, oh, I have the best solution to solve his problem, right? How should they go about effectively selling to enterprises? That's a great question. And I love this topic because I love to help founders be more effective at engaging with enterprises. Um, I think the, the biggest mistake you can make is show up at an enterprise's door pitching features and benefits. I personally don't think buyers buy features and benefits. They buy a solution to the problem. Uh, it also depends on where you are in your company's journey. So, um, you know, if you're very early, it's an opportunity to co-create. Like you're bringing talent and expertise and the ability to execute at speed. Um, I was telling somebody the other day that when I was at TD Waterhouse, we wrote our online accounting um, code and deployed it to production, I think, in a couple of weeks. We built our advice engine 
I remember writing the code to integrate our advice engine in an afternoon. You know, there was that ability to just build and deploy things so fast that uh, I miss I miss these days. But it's important, depending on where you are in your journey. Like if you're if you're a mature startup with a with a known platform and you've got lots of customers and you know exactly how and why your customers use your product, then when you're having a conversation with the enterprise, it's important to to listen and understand where exactly you fit in, right? Because you're either going to complement an existing set of tools and platforms, or you're going to replace something. And I think it's important to assess which of those options you're going to be in the overall portfolio. One of the earliest lessons I learned when I showed up in New York as an 18-year-old was something called the golden rule, which is he who holds the gold makes the rules. <laughs> and uh, that's important as well, is make sure, make sure you're talking to a buyer. Um, right? So if I was to summarize, I'll say, make sure you're talking to a buyer, don't sell features and benefits, do a lot of listening. Um, if you're early stage, think about how you can co-create with the enterprise because you know you will solve a lot of the typical problems you face as a um, as a startup. You'll validate your product. You'll understand your product roadmap. You'll uh, you'll determine product market fit. You know, there's a whole bunch of host of um, benefits to having those kinds of conversations. And then if you're a more mature company. Definitely uh, understanding the enterprise view. How does your product show up across a number of different enterprises? Where, where you're addressing pain points and how you fit in. Now, this is one of my passions, by the way, and I, I love talking to founders about this stuff. Um, I remember, by the way, Bo started introduced me to Sneak uh, when Sneak was two, I think two or three people with an idea, and I remember having this conversation about, um, you know, I think Sneak in the, in that iteration was built for Python. And having this conversation about how enterprises were very much into Java, um, and to Sneak's credit, they retooled the, the product to focus on Java almost overnight. You know, uh, and seeing that journey from idea to uh, the level of scale that Sneak is at today has been amazingly fulfilling. Um, and you know, I wish that journey for every every founder out there that they're able to take that um, passion uh, that's invested into the product and and build it out into something that has enormous impact across uh, across the ecosystem. Well, one thing I will definitely not be forgetting is the golden rule. <laughs> that's that I was not expecting you to say that, <laughs> which was which was very good. Uh, but Sid, thank you so much for the time and for uh, talking through everything. Um, is there anything that you'd like to highlight for listeners that's coming up for uh, BNY Mellon, either on the the company side or the or the tech side, whichever you pr prefer? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, it's a it's a hugely exciting time to be here at the bank. Uh, for anybody that's interested in what we do or why we do it, I recommend reading our last annual report, uh, which I think was a great overview of uh, the things that we do well, as well as where we're looking to improve. And then uh, on the data analytics front, I think I'm really excited about how we're showing up to customers, how we want to grow that business, uh, be more for our customers in that regard. Um, and on the tech side, you know, it's always interesting and, and evolving. Um, I love being at a at a bank that has such an enterprise viewpoint. Um, I think we're building new uh, new products and, and capabilities. We're very much tech enabled um, across our businesses, and uh, you know, it's definitely an interesting time to be in tech and an interesting time to be at the bank. Well, it sounds like BNY Mellon is hiring. So for for all those listening, if you're looking for a job, uh, you know, <laughs> look for Sid and, uh, and and see if you can get on his team. But thank you so much for the time and and really appreciate and some 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 great takeaways here. Uh, some that I will be stealing and reusing for sure. So really appreciate it. This was fun. Thanks for having me, Sean.